All right. So, and you know, don't hesitate to you know throw things in the chat. If you have any questions, you know, please interrupt me. Okay. So, uh, calculus, or in our case, analysis, that's the study of functions, right? And there are other things. There's algebra, you know, which is the study of sets with axioms on them, and topology, which is the study of open sets, stuff like this. Uh, analysis, for our purposes, we want to study functions. And so to start off, we should know what a function is. So we're going to use notation here, which is common in mathematics, but especially coming from high school, you might not have seen before. So if A and B are sets, so a function is a, an assignment, let's say a unique assignment, oh man, I haven't done any writing in like four months and so I can feel that my hand is not not doing what it's supposed to. This unique assignment of every element in A to an element of B. All right? We write to denote. function. Okay, so I strongly suspect that many of you know the definition of a function, right, that it is this unique assignment of something in one set to another. Uh, the thing here that might be new to you is this notation. Okay, so this is the notation that you use for a function, and it tells you what the uh, domain is and what the codomain is. So let's kind of talk about what those words are. So in this case, we say A here is called the domain. That's not crazy. You've probably heard that before. This one might be new, though. B is called the codomain. Okay, so it's not called the range. Range is something different. This is the codomain. And the codomain just tells you where all of your, like, where the, the images of the functions actually live, right? So you don't have to hit everything in the set B. It's just where those things actually live. Okay. And now, when we think about functions, and I know especially when a lot of people come out of high school thinking about functions, they like to think about functions, you know, from R to R. They like to think about the graph of a function. These are not true. So first of all, you can see here, the definition of a function works between any two sets. And that, moreover, uh, the, it's nothing to do with the graph, right? The graph here does not show up in any way, shape, or form. How the graph is related to a function is in that formative document that I sent out earlier, and we'll talk about it in a second. But don't think about a function in terms of a graph. Think of it almost as a machine, right? It eats things in A and produces things in B, right? Or you can think about it as a mapping, an assignment of things in A to things in B. So let me give you an example. Maybe let's do a non-standard example just so that we really are like, okay, I definitely can't think of this thing in terms of its graph. Oops. Okay, so example, let's take A to be the people here. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable set, right? And let's take uh, B to be uh, the days of the year. Right, so for example, January 1st, you know, March 15th, September 8th, those, those sorts of days. And we can define a function which maps each person to their birthday. Right, and you can imagine these are not the, the types of functions we're gonna be studying. But sometimes it helps just to have a bit of an abstract example in your mind. Right, so which sends each person, apparently they're doing some construction outside. So hopefully that's not too bothersome. Okay. Anyone willing to volunteer to be part of the example? 
I just put in the chat what your birthday is so that I can write it in as okay. So F of Victor is oh oh okay. I love the participation, but now it's getting buried and I can't even see it. Uh December 6th. Okay. I'm just gonna choose the next one at random. So Victor gets the first one because he answered first. Okay, and then we're gonna do uh Matthew, because you I just you happen to be there July 3rd. Is there anyone whose birthday is today? I think they should get a special. Nobody's birthday is today? That's okay. You don't want your birthday to be the first day of classes, right? That that would suck. William, well, just because you're the last one, February 17th. Okay, so that makes sense. So, so sorry for those of you who you know volunteered and I didn't grab you. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I love that you threw your birthday in there. We're willing to share that, um, but I don't want to write out 70 birthdays, right? So you'll notice as well, though, an important point here is that not every day of the year is going to get hit, right? In fact, it's impossible. There's only how many of us are in this meeting? 69 of us in this meeting, and there's 365 days in the year, right? So there's no possible way that every single day of the year is uh, a birthday for somebody in this class. So it's definitely not the range, right? Um, it's just the, the space where things actually live, where the outputs of the functions actually live, okay? So if you want, the range is actually the set of all dates that would be hit, right? Uh, we'll define that later, and we won't use the word range. We'll use a different word, um, but that's an example, okay? Uh, any questions so far? Does that make sense? What if two people have the same birthday? I mean, that's fine, though. You can do that. We know of lots of functions where that's true. Um, if we just go back to, or for example, you could find another function. Right, so let's like A be the set of all English words. Let's let B be the alphabet. And then let's define a function, let's call it G, which just takes the first letter from the word, which outputs the first letter, right? So you'd have something like G of cat equals C, G of math, equals m and clearly there are lots of outputs that have or inputs that have the same output right so it's okay for two things to map to the same thing right uh, what a function can't do is take a single output to two different uh or single input to two different outputs right so a person can't have two birthdays that's not allowed because that wouldn't be a function Right, but two different people can have the same birthday. That's actually totally fine. In fact, does anyone know in this uh, classroom of 69 people, actually 68, because the thing I'm drawing on is not a person, in this classroom, what's the probability that two people have the same birthday? Anyone know this problem? Nobody knows? Okay, 50, yeah. Yeah, someone, yeah. Uh, yeah, what's 50? 23 people is a 50% chance. Uh, so the answer in the case of 69 people is 99.99%. So basically one, yeah. So this is an exercise we can try someday. I'll put up a calendar and I'll let you all uh, indicate it, right? Like. William, we don't want to do this because if everyone just spams the chat with their birthdays, trying to find which two are the same is going to be hard. But we can do it next time. What I'll do is I'll actually put up a calendar and people can like cross off their birthdays. And then we'll see that a couple people will cross off the same dates, right? So this is like, this is called the birthday problem, if any of you want to check it out, right? And just see why it's true. Um, but it's kind of this new, it's, it's a fun thing, right? With 23 people, it's a 50-50 chance. Um, okay, so now we're not going to have to worry about this too much, but this is something that always drove me insane, 
is that one thing you're going to realize in math is you'll, especially when you get into upper years, your profs will use words that nobody has ever explained to you what they mean before. So for me, for example, it was always the word pathological. People would talk about, oh, this is a pathological example. And you're like, okay, I know what the English word pathological means, but what does that mean mathematically? And I'm not gonna explain that to you until we actually get to a pathological example. Uh, but another one is well-defined, okay? So, uh, so definition, so a function, or let's say a map. Uh, what do I wanna say here? Uh, oh, you know what? No, no, let's do this as an example. Okay, so is this a function? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a map from the rational numbers to the integers, okay? Does everyone write the Q, weird Q thing? Those are the rational numbers, so the set of all whole number fractions. And then the Z are the integers, right? So it's the collection of all whole numbers, period. So negative whole numbers, zero, positive whole numbers. And the way I'm gonna define this map is I'm gonna take the fraction and I'm going to map it to its numerator. Okay, so is this a function? Okay, got some yeses. Right, because we could do things, you're like, yeah, this is totally fine, right? We could do like three quarters equals three. Okay, we've got some no's. Okay, so why not? So those of you who say no, what could go wrong? Ah, yeah, okay. Unless we have a rule, right, exactly. Okay, so Divyanch and Jianjun, exactly. Unless we have a rule that the, that the fraction is in lowest terms, we don't know that this is true because these two numbers are the same, right? Three quarters and six eighths, but they actually give us different outputs, right? And that's a problem because we said each number has to have a unique output, right? It can only output to a single thing. It's not allowed to output to two or three or four things. And in fact, you can see in this case, well, why just stop at six eights, right? Why not do nine twelfths? Um, and then the output would be nine. And basically we could then make the output of the fraction be whatever we wanted it to be. And so that would be an issue, right? It's not really a fraction anymore. Uh, so this is not a function. So this is not a function because it's not well-defined. And if I were to stop there, you'd be like, okay, sure. I guess that makes sense. Right, so uh, Yvonne, so is the fraction in lowest terms? I didn't specify that it had to be. And so because of that, you don't know. Now, if we said the fraction is in lowest terms, now output the numerator, then it would be a function, right? And that, that actually would be one. Um, but because I didn't specify that, it's not. So it's not a function because it's not well-defined. And if I left it here, you'd be like, okay, I kind of understand what that means. Like, I know what the English words well-defined means. And I believe that this thing does, is not defined well. But there's actually a mathematical definition of being well-defined. Okay, so a map. is well-defined. And I've said map here. What a map is, is I don't want to get too deeply into it, but a mapping is not quite a function. Um, it's an assignment of things in A to things in B, um, but it doesn't have to satisfy that uniqueness property that a function does. Is so, But we're not going to worry about maps at all in this class. It's just you know, a way of saying, I'm dealing with something that's like a function, but I'm not guaranteeing it's a function yet. Okay, so a map f from a to b is well defined if for every x and y in a, x equals y implies f of x equals f of y. Okay, and so if we parse this sentence and we think about like what is this actually saying, it says that if the inputs are the same, then the outputs also have to be the same, right? That's what this says. So this says if the inputs are the same, the 
than the outputs are as well. Right? And that was not true above because three quarters and six eighths are the same number. But when I plugged them into my function f, I got different things out, right? I got three and six out, and those aren't the same thing. So despite the fact that I put in the same number, I got different outputs. So that is not a well-defined mapping. So therefore, it's not a function, right? Functions have to be well-defined. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? But how does the definition of well-defined map differ from that of a function? Uh, they actually don't, right? They actually are the same. A well-defined map is a function. They are the same thing. So again, this isn't something we're going to worry about too much in this class. It will only come up a couple of times that I talk about whether or not a function is well-defined. As you get into higher level math, and in particular, as you start working on quotients or equivalence relations, uh, well-definedness becomes a very important property because you'll then have uh, when you work on quotients or equivalence classes, you'll have multiple things that look different that are secretly equal. And if you want to define functions there, you need to make sure that when two things are equal, they give you the same output, right? Uh, so that's just something that you, we will only have to worry about a couple times but uh, in this class, but you'll have to worry about a lot in future classes. Okay. All right, let's do very quickly injection uh, and surjection. All right, so a function f from a to b is injective. If and this is going to look really familiar. So it's injective if for every x and y in the domain, if f of x is equal to f of y, then x is equal to y. Now, I know a couple of you have the advantage of maybe having taken 102, um, but can anyone explain to me, in like, in, not in math words, but explain to me, it, just using plain English, what is an injective function? Like, what is an injective function? What is this definition trying to tell us? Every A has unique B, sure. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Or maybe, uh, actually, I would say it the other way, right, Divyaj? I'd say every B comes from a unique A or nothing at all, right? Uh, Yuan Zhi, one to one, perfect. Yep, one to one is a great way of saying it. The reverse, map, reverse mapping is a function. OK, so this is an interesting one, uh, Jianjun. We need to be a little bit careful about that, but you're right if we add in an extra condition, right? Um, function is increasing or decreasing, not necessarily, we have to be careful. This is an interesting one um, that increasing and decreasing functions are injective, but not necessarily the other direction is true. Um, and importantly, increasing and decreasing are only defined on the reals or on, on sets in which you have a way of comparing order. Um, and you could, for example, we should be able to talk about whether, you know, these two functions are injective, even though I don't know how to make sense of whether, uh, you know, uh, any of these functions are increasing, decreasing, right? Maybe we could figure out a way of talking about the birthday function being increasing or decreasing, but, um, you know, it's probably not our usual notion of increasing, decreasing, but right. So we've, we've seen a couple of good ideas, uh, bigger than or equal to a, Yes. Yeah, that's actually a really good one as well. The inverse reverse mapping can only exist if function is one to one. Yeah, and and that's something like Jun said. But I want to be very careful about that, and I'll talk about it in a second. But yes, that is the right idea. Uh, and if on one to one and onto knock, yeah, that would be surjective as well. Okay, so let's let's go through it. So this says. that if the outputs are equal, right? Yeah, 
if the outputs are the same, then they must have come from the same input, right? And that might sound a little silly because uh, you're being like, yeah, I guess that's, is that a weird thing to say? Do we even need to define that? But somebody brought this up. Uh, the birthday function would not be injective then, exactly. Uh, and I mean, it, but it, again, William, we have to be careful. It really depends because we didn't actually check whether or not the birthday function was injective, right? Uh, statistically, it's not going to be, um, but we didn't actually check that it's not injective. So let's let's kind of put this, here's an easier example. Let's take a look at the, the function, which just eat, like took a word and outputted the first letter. That's not injective, right? So the function g that we had above, is not injective, right? Because we said g of math is equal to m, and that's equal to g of mom, right? So their outputs are the same, but they, have, they came from different inputs, right? All right, so same output. but different input. Right? And an injective function says if two things have the same output, the only way that can happen is if it came from the same input, right? Which is the statement that some of the people in the chat were saying that everything in B comes from a unique element in A. So uh, any element or let's say every element in B is at most one G of something. Uh, comes from at most. one element of A, okay? Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, so if two or more people have the same birthday, then it's not injective, which is what I was saying, like statistically, we don't actually know if the birthday function in this class is injective because we didn't actually check to see if two people had the same birthday. Um, but you can see now that the domain can actually change whether or not a function is injective, right? If there are two people in this class that have the same birthday, then the birthday function is not injective because two different people will have the same birthday. But if we shrunk the number of people in this class, right? If I took, if I like snapped half of you away, uh, then it's possible that two people, no two people would share a birthday, right? And then that function would become injective. This is a really critical point that's different about what happens in, in high school. When you learn functions in high school, they often, do this silly thing where they say, oh, find the domain of this function, right? But that's BS, okay? Because functions come with a domain, always. You, you never find the domain of a function. The domain is part of the data of a function. You have to specify the domain before you can even specify the function, okay? So this is a very important and critical difference between how we treat functions in real life, in real math, and how they treat them in high school, okay? And so they can change things. Okay, so let's quickly do surjective. So a function is surjective. Is surjective. If every element in B is the image of some point in A. Okay, so, right, let's break this down. Everything in the codomain
and then has something in the domain which maps to it. Right? So in this case, this is saying, is it B belongs to, oh yeah, you're right, thank you. I used Y there, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so in this case, this is saying that the range is the codomain, right? So again, if we think about the range, which I haven't formally defined, but you probably have an intuition for it. The range is the set of all things that you map onto, right? The outputs of your function. And so what this is saying is that, well, every single thing in the codomain is an output. The range and the codomain are the same thing. Okay. So the birthday function is not surjective because there's no way we hit every single day of the year with only 70 of us, right? But the, uh, the function G, which ate a word and outputted the first letter of that word, that's definitely surjective. Right? And we can find a word that starts with every letter of the alphabet. Does that make sense? So let's very quickly do this example because I want to show you how things can really change as you change the domain and codomain, how you can change the properties of whether or not a function is injective or surjective. So let's say, as an example, So each function below maps x to x squared. Okay, so it's your it's your usual friend that takes a number and squares it, right? So the input is seven, the output is forty nine, right? The input is ten, the output is one hundred. But what I'm going to do is in each of these cases, I'm going to change the domain and codomain. So F1 is going to map R to R, real numbers to real numbers. F2 is going to map R to, let's say, the open interval 0, 1. F3 maps the open interval 0, 1 to R. F4 maps 0, 1 to 0, 1. OK. And injective. Surjective. Okay. So we want to look at the first function. It maps x to x squared, right? It's our usual thing. If you were to think about the graph of this thing, it's your usual parabola. Is this map injective? No, right. Can anyone just give me a quick example? Negative one and one, right? Both of them map to one, right? Negative two and two both map to four, exactly, right? So we've got two different things which map to the same thing, so it's not uh, injective. Is it surjective? Okay, so we've got one yes, and we've got a bunch of no. So someone give me an example of, if you don't believe it's surjective, give me something that can't, that is not in the output. Right, so if you don't believe that it's surjective, what thing in the, oh, sorry, my, my screen froze there. Nothing maps to negative one, negative two, right? Zero infinity, so Alan, you're kind of talking about what the, uh, the range is, the negative part in the codomain. Exactly, right, so nothing maps to the negative numbers, right? Right, this, there's no x which does this, right? There's no x such that f of x is equal to negative one. So it's not surjective. OK, great. Let's do f2. So uh, again, is it injective? Right, OK, no. Because you still get the same problem as before, right? Negative one and one map to the same thing, right? OK, is it surjective? Yeah, for sure it is, right? 
because square roots exist, which I'm going to assume that we know, but we know that square roots exist, right? We can take the square root of any number in zero and one, and that will be the thing which maps to um, the point that we're interested in. Okay, F3. Is F3 injected? Yeah, perfect. Because the reason, obviously, that we run into trouble with injectivity is the negative numbers map to the same thing as their positive counterpart. Here we've thrown away all the negatives, so yeah, it is going to end up being injective. And right, right now, we're not proving this. These aren't proofs, so make sure that you actually do them. Uh, is it surjective? Right, yeah, it's not surjective. What's a point that doesn't get hit? Well, the same thing works, right? Negative one also can't be hit. But same thing, there's nothing which maps to four, for example, right? Because something that maps to four, yeah, exactly. There's tons of numbers that aren't hit, right? Okay, very last one, uh, F4, is F4 injective? Okay, great, yeah. And is it surjective? Yeah, it's also surjective, right? And that one's a little bit, you have to think about that one for a bit, but yeah, so the square root of a number between zero and one is always between zero and one, right? And the square of a number between zero and one is always between zero and one. So this number is actually both injective and surjective. And so hopefully you can see the role of the domain and codomain play a big difference in whether or not a function is surjective or injective, right? So we can't just, this is what I'm saying, like in high school, when they say, find the domain of a function, that's dumb. Functions come with a domain and a codomain, and you have to specify them ahead of time, right? Because it changes the properties of the function. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, we're out of time. We're going to talk a little bit more about functions next time, and then we'll get into um, maybe start constructing the reals. Uh, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to hang around for a bit after class if anyone wants to talk or ask any questions or anything. But otherwise, I know some of you probably have other classes that you have to go to, so feel free to run. Uh, let me uh, let me kill the recording here because I don't think we need it anymore.